Good morning, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me again express publicly my gratitude for the blessing of being with you. I've been enriched by the worship, by the study of God's word, and by our time together. Let me again thank Pastor for just letting me be a part. The message we just heard was worth the whole trip for me. <laughs> Amen. Praise God for heaven. I'm also in a good mood this morning. My son came to hear his old man preach this morning. And so, uh, amen. Uh, H.B. the third is here <laughs> to, uh, to uh, be with us. Glad to have him there. Would you take your copy of God's Word and be turning with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me breathe a word of prayer. And then again, I want you to hear the reading of God's Word. Father, we recognize that we are just pilgrims sojourning through this land on our way home. We thank you for your sustaining grace and for the blessed hope that is before us. We thank you for this time together this weekend to set our thoughts on your great promises and our future hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all that we've already heard, learned, and experienced, and we commit what is yet to come to you. And even now, this hour, we pray afresh that you would help us to receive with gentleness the implanted word that is able to save our souls and that you would help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Help us to look into the perfect law of liberty and not be forgetful hearers, but doers of the work, that we may be blessed in all of our ways, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Second Corinthians 5, 1 through 10 is about the hope of heaven. But I would point your attention to the end of chapter 4, which addresses a subject that I think matters greatly for the Christian journey, not just the hope of what's to come, but in a real sense, what do you do in the meantime? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 reads, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, the, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 16 begins with a bold assertion. So we do not lose heart. That opening statement is the theme of the passage. And for that matter, it is the theme of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 reads, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Now, in verse 14, Paul ends the chapter where he started. So we do not lose heart. 
To lose heart is to be exhausted, spiritless, weary. Picture a farmer in the field who is so exhausted that he quits the work. Picture a soldier in battle who is so discouraged that he gives up the fight. To lose heart is to grow faint-hearted to the point of giving up. Luke 18 verse 1, Jesus tells a parable. Luke introduces the parable by stating the purpose of the parable. You ought always to pray and not lose heart. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we will reap the harvest if we do not lose heart. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul testifies with spiritual resolve. We do not lose heart. We'd be leaders in the church at Corinth challenged Paul's ministerial credentials. They claimed he was weak. They criticized his ministry, claiming that if you track his work, he experiences more suffering than success. In remarkable fashion, Paul in 2 Corinthians responds to his enemies' attacks by agreeing with them. He was weak, but his weakness was the platform for God's strength. He did suffer, but his suffering was the platform for God's glory. The proof of this was that in the midst of all that he was going through, Paul says, we do not lose heart. If it was just me, I would have quit a long time ago. But we do not lose heart. Go down to chapter 11 with me. So that we're not speaking merely in generic terms. What did he go through? Verse 23, chapter 11. Far greater labors, far more imprisonments. Countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. A fraction of those things would have made the average person throw in the towel. And yet Paul says, we do not lose heart. But note, 
Paul's indomitable spirit was not personal fortitude. Spiritual realities and resources undergirded his faith, and I commend that those spiritual realities and resources are available to everyone who trusts in Christ. No, you may not face the variety, intensity, and severity of Paul's suffering, but I submit to you that If you keep going to bed at night and waking up in the morning, all of us will find ourselves at quitting points where we are tempted to lose heart. If you are not there now, don't dismiss this message. You better put this one in the bank for a rainy day. You will face quitting points in life when you are tempted to lose heart. And I would add that faith does not prevent this temptation to lose heart. Paul, with all of his devotion to Christ, by making this confession is also acknowledging that there is reality of a temptation to lose heart. you will face those times. In a room with this many people, some of you are there right now. You cannot control your reality, but the good news is you can control your response. We do not lose heart. During a flight from Portland, Maine to Boston, pilot of a small aircraft, Henry Dempsey, heard a noise at the back of the plane and went to investigate, leaving the controls to his co-pilot. As he went to the back of the plane to investigate the sound he was hearing, the plane hit an air pocket. He lost his balance and quickly found out what the sound was he was hearing. The rear door had not been properly latched. As it flew open, Dempsey was sucked from the plane. His co-pilot, made an emergency landing, reported that the pilot had fallen out of the plane, called for search and rescue in the waters below. But when they landed, they found Dempsey holding on to the outer ladder of the aircraft. Somehow, in the process of all of this, he had caught the ladder and held on for 10 minutes as the plane landed. And the part of the story that caught my attention is that it took them several minutes to pry his fingers from the ladder. <laughs> there will be turbulence in your life that will place you in the precarious situation where you will have only one of two choices, give up or hold on. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses 16 through 18 gives three reasons why you should hold on no matter what. The first reason is the process of inward renewal. We do not lose heart because of the process of inward renewal. Verse 16 describes a contradictory process that is taking place within the believer. 
On one hand, Paul says, the outer self is wasting away. The outer self is wasting away. Verse 16 says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Outer self is one of several ways Paul describes physical life in this chapter. Verse 7 calls it jars of clay. Verse 10 calls it the body. Verse 11 calls it our mortal flesh. Here Paul calls it the outer self. Life in our physical bodies. And he says of life in these physical bodies, it is wasting away. This may be a statement directly about Paul's labors for Christ and the battles for the gospel that had taken their toll on him. But, but ultimately, this statement refers to the present constant and inevitable process of physical deterioration that every person experiences. We are wasting away. Genesis 3.19, the Lord says to Adam, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And this is the fate of every descendant of Adam and Eve. The outer self is wasting away. It's not so obvious when you're young. Young people are filled with life and health, strength, vitality, and hope. Seems like you'll live forever. But you, too, are wasting away. It is why Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 warns, remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. This statement is not just about the old or the sick or the weak. What is described here is happening to all of us. Science and doctors tell us that 50 to 70 billion cells die in the average adult every day. The outer self is wasting away. And diet, exercise, and living right does not stop that process. You should do those things, but it does not halt our steady march to the grave. I just had an, another birthday last weekend and been thinking of those who say, I'm not getting older, I'm getting better. Yeah, no, you're getting older. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting older. The outer self is wasting away. Maybe put a footnote here just to say this statement is a stern rebuke of our cosmetic culture. We nip and tuck to give the illusion of youth and beauty and vitality, but it doesn't change the reality that the outer self is wasting away. Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8 says, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are like the grass. 
grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. And so on one hand, Paul says the outer self is wasting away, but then note, on the other hand, he says the inner self is being renewed. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Paul was becoming old and tired and weak, and this process was intensified and accelerated by his sufferings for Christ. Yet a paradox was at work. As the outer self was wasting away, the inner self was being renewed day by day. Physically, Paul was facing death. Spiritually, Paul was enjoying life. A moral transformation was taking place underneath the skin. Paul was being renewed. New life was growing as his mortal life was dying. And he says this process of renewal is happening day by day. Paul speaks in personal terms of testimony here, but this is the reality. This is the testimony of every Christian. We are in the words of Colossians 3.10. We put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. You may not feel it. But the indwelling presence of the life giver king is at work in every true child of God. And the inner self is being renewed day by day. In an ultimate sense. Day by day, the Christian uniquely experiences Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His compassions never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The outer self is Wasting away by the inner self is being renewed day by day. Michelangelo said it this way, the more the marble wastes, the more the statue grows. That's true of every Christian. It's true only of Christians. Without Christ, the outer self is wasting away and the inner self is wasting away. It doesn't matter how many Wonderful things you enjoy in this life, you will end up testifying with the preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity is van- of vanity. All is vanity. That's the inevitable reality that the life without Christ will ultimately face. All of it was empty, chasing after the wind. But everything changes when you trust the the crucified but risen Savior. It is not vanity. In fact, just the opposite. If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. When Adam and Eve sinned, they died. They died immediately, spiritually, as they were separated from God. Progressively, they died morally, going from bad to worse. Ultimately, they died physically. This is the crisis of inherited sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Faith in the second Adam changes everything. Immediately you are born again. Progressively you are growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ and ultimately you will live forever in glory. Though the outer 
self is wasting away. The inner self is renewed day by day. So the first reason we do not lose heart is the process of inward renewal. But secondly, the reason why we do not lose heart is the preparation for future glory. We do not lose heart because whatever we face, no matter how bad it is, is just preparation for future glory. Verse 17. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Hallelujah. Four facts about affliction in this verse. The first one I'll only spend a moment on. Affliction is real, Paul tells us here. He confronts us with the reality that following Christ does not bring some unbroken succession of health, wealth, and success in this life. Even as a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, you will face affliction. Affliction is pressure. The pressure described by the word is, is not merely what we call stress. The word pictures here life threatening, faith stretching, soul crushing pressure. Hold the translations, call it tribulation. Christians face affliction. There will be times when you will face affliction in spite of your devotion to Christ. There will be times when you face affliction because of your devotion to Christ. John 16 verse 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Acts 14, verse 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who would live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Affliction is real. But secondly, verse 17 says, affliction, hold on to your seat. He says, affliction. Affliction, this soul-crushing, faith-stretching pressure, he says affliction is light. Well, this is the contradiction, is it not? How can it be affliction if it's light? How can it be a heavy burden if it is light? How can it be tribulation if it is light? The word here, light, is the same word used in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, where Jesus explains why you should come to him and why you should take on his yoke, why you should learn from him. For my yoke is easy and my Burden is what? Light. And I appreciate the fact that Jesus in the call to discipleship puts the reality of following him in bold language at the top of the contract, not in fine print at the bottom. He, he says, if you come to me, I will put a burden on you. But it'll be light. My father 
was born and raised in his early years in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And I remember as a boy listening to him preach on the end of Matthew 11, and he would say that when he was a boy, his, his father never yoked together true, two strong mules in the field. He would yoke a strong one to a weak one, and the, the strength of the strong one would compensate for the weakness of the weak one. Is that not what Jesus means when he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light? His burden is light because he is in the harness with you carrying the heaviest part. If the burden of trusting and obeying Christ Jesus seems too heavy for you this morning, friend, could it be that you are trying to carry it on your own? No burden is too heavy if you lean on Jesus. Affliction is real. Affliction is light. He thirdly says affliction is momentary. It is light, momentary affliction. It is just for the moment. This is no guarantee that the sorrows and sufferings and sickness of life will be brief. Some burdens you will carry for years, for decades, for a lifetime. You may be going through something that will never get better in this life, but this still applies to you in Christ. It's a light, momentary affliction. Psalm 90 verse 10 says, the years of our lives are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. But in Christ, we have the assurance that trouble doesn't last always. I love Psalm 30, verse 5. God's anger is just for the moment. But his favor is for a lifetime. What does that look like? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Affliction is light. Affliction is momentary. Affliction is real. Now get to the heart of it. Affliction, the fourth fact he gives us in this verse is that affliction is productive. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. By, by this lofty language, Paul is in no way suggesting that enduring suffering produces salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works. So that the one who is saved has nothing to boast or brag about. God gets all the glory. Affliction is not the way to heaven. Christ is the way. But here we are reminded that there is a heavenly reward to be won or lost. Second John 8, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Paul is saying here that present affliction is spiritual preparation for future glory. God uses the affliction 
to prepare for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I don't know what that means, but I like it. (laughs) I can't explain that phrase. I just want to say amen to it. We don't lose heart. Because the tears, the sorrows, the burdens, the trials, the betrayals, the hurts, the needs, God is using all of it to prepare for us a far more weighty glory that will be beyond all comparison. So as hard as it may be, friend, ignore what you're going through for the moment. Forget what you're going through right now. Overlook it for now and consider this. If only you knew what God was preparing for you through that trouble, you would not worry, complain, or give up. Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that shall be revealed in us. This is nothing compared to the glory that God is preparing through the affliction. And so we do not lose heart because of the process of inward renewal, the preparation for future glory, and thirdly, because of our perspective on eternal realities. Verse 18. Our perspective on eternal realities. Verse 18 says, we do not lose heart because we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. The look here is not a casual glance. Concerning this word, Alan Redpath wrote, it is the word you would use if you were to pick up a telescope and try to bring something far away into view and into focus. It is a word that suggests an intense examination, a constant scrutiny, a steady gaze. but I suggest that it carries with it a conditional force. He is saying to endure. If you are not to lose heart, you must focus on invisible and eternal realities. He says, first of all, focus on invisible realities. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. This here is not a distinction between the mature Christian and the carnal Christian or the immature Christian. It is a distinction between Christian and non-Christians. Unbelievers look at things that are seen. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. What is this faith we walk by? Hebrews 11 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things, what? Not seen. If you only look at what you can see, you will lose heart. Strength comes to those who look to unseen things. First Peter 1, verses 8 and 9, Paul says, or Peter says, 
though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The story is coming to mind right now. The reference is, and pardon me, but the king was determined to get rid of the prophet Elijah. And one morning, his servant goes out to get the paper and looks up in the distance and sees that they are surrounded by the enemy. <laughs> and he goes back in and tells the prophet. You remember what the prophet tells his servant? He said, don't, don't, don't trip about that. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And I bet that servant was thinking, he didn't see what I just saw. <laughs> but the prophet prayed, Lord, open his eyes. And then told him, look again. And when he looked again, there were Chariots and war horses in the air. Oh, friend, I know things look bad, but in the name of Jesus, I plead with you, look again. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Goodness and mercy is following you. The God who cannot lie says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is our refuge and strength. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. Joseph says to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God was with me and he meant it for good. And so I plead with you to focus on invisible realities, but then also focus on eternal realities. Focus on eternal realities. The passage is littered with paradoxical statements. Did you catch them? It's a, it's a text full of paradoxes. The outer self is wasting away. The inner self is being renewed. Light Momentary affliction is producing an eternal weight of glory. We are looking at the things that are unseen, not at the things that are seen. One more paradox. The things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. We don't look at the things that are seen because everything we see is transient. It's bound by time. It is only temporary. I said it in passing last night. Let me repeat it. This is the economy of Scripture. This is how to figure out the economy of Scripture. In Scripture... What lasts the longest is worth the most. And so Matthew, 6, Matthew 19, verse 26, Jesus says, for instance, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What, what does it profit a man? To live in a big house in a gated community, but your soul is homeless before God. 
What does it profit a man to drive a fancy car with two names on the hood, but your soul is thumbing a ride? What does it profit a man to wear expensive clothes with a European designer's name on the label, but your soul is naked before God? Do not consume your life with the things that are transient. Or Matthew 6, 19, 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. We do not look to the things that are seen because the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And it is from that statement that Paul then says, for we know, verse 1, chapter 5, that if this tent That is, our earthly home is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I was a boy preacher. I'm not recommending anything I say here. I'm just, this is my testimony. I was a boy preacher and um, my father not only administering to the church there in Los Angeles, he also had a friend he was helping who started his own funeral home and my father would often fill in and I, as a boy, I just went, wherever my dad was, it didn't matter. I wanted to be with him. So I ended up as a boy at a lot of funerals. And as a boy preacher, I, I said, Dad, well, can I help? And um, he would only let me do two things. It was my father's practice to lead the family in during the procession. And during that procession, he would read aloud Psalm 90. He would let me read Psalm 90 as I walked in beside him. He never let me do anything in the funeral. Ever. Then we would get to the cemetery and he would hand me his little star book for ministers and say, I'll let you read the committal. I was a young, I wanted to do something in the service. He'd make me stand there at the graveside and read the committal before he gave the calls and prayer. I just, oh, man. I did it so many times. I read that thing so many times that without trying, I memorized it. (laughs) But over the years, when I became a pastor, I recognized this this is one of the key parts of a funeral. This is what makes a Christian funeral a Christian funeral. When you stand there at an open grave with grieving family members and one marker after another that all, no matter what the names and details on it, they all announce the same thing, death one. And the preacher of the gospel dares to say in the midst of death's stronghold, Inasmuch as it has pleased Almighty God to take out of this world the soul of our deceased brother, we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, looking for the general resurrection in the last day and the life of the world to come through Jesus Christ our Lord at whose second coming in glorious majesty to judge the world 
Hear this phrase. The earth and the sea shall give up their dead. And the corruptible bodies of those that sleep in him will be changed. And made like his own glorious body. How? By the power with which he is able to make everything submit to him. Do you believe that, church? If so, then I dare you in the midst of what you are facing to say with Paul. We do not lose heart. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Jesus Christ who is our all-sufficient prophet, priest, and king. We give you praise for his righteous life, his atoning death at the cross, his triumphant resurrection from the dead, his glorious ascension, and his present intercessory ministry on our behalf. And we thank you that he is soon to come again. These past months, these couple of years has just been filled with so much sickness and sorrow and suffering for so many of us. And I pray in the name of Jesus, you would help us to look beyond what we can see and to look to the unseen to ignore the things that are passing away and focus our attention on the things that abide forever. Help us to remember that the present affliction, no matter how heavy the burden, is not the last word. You're just strategically using it to prepare for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And even as these bodies, these tents we live in are wasting away, you're renewing us from the inside out. And so I pray, Father, for the person who's carrying the heavy burden under the sound of my voice that you would prove afresh in their experience that your grace is sufficient and your strength is sufficient. Your strength works best in weak people. And as we lean and depend on you, help us to resolve that we will not lose heart in Jesus' name. Amen.